one, one, two, one, two, check, check. I just, oh, I just realised, just realised, hang on, can you hear me? Oh, I just realised, yeah, right, I just realised the reason Nigel thought this was a different microphone is because it's the same, oh, look, <laughs> it's that microphone, but I put this on it. So, here early, 10 minutes early, you get to see the secrets. This is just the end of my boom mic when I'm doing the, the big shotgun boom mic, which I don't do very much of anymore. This is the end of that. It goes on the end of this big, like, sculptural mic cover. So it's a good pop shield if you just unscrew it and put it on your microphone like that. And then when you see it like that, it's like, oh, what's that? Oh, is that a new? Oh, looks nice, doesn't it? It does. So, so there you go. That's what's been happening there. <laughs> Not been on much this week. Computer's been chugging away with the old edit for Mental Health Monday. Which officially starts in, what, 10 minutes? We've got 10 minutes of this. I thought, you know, I'm always trying to get here five, 10 minutes early to make sure it doesn't chuff in. It's just working better these days. It's just working better. I don't know why. Let's pop you out. Just let them ask. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see this, but the space that I've allocated on the desk for the mouse is right over there. <laughs> I don't know if you ever tried that. Your mouse doesn't have to be where you need it to be. It can be right over there. So you can reach right over and get... I've got it now. I've got it. You can't see that off camera, but I'm reaching down to the edge of the table, right to the edge. That's the news <laughs> pinged on my phone there. The seven worst habits for your brain. How often should you shower, really? What calories may not count much as you... They're doing mental health on my news on the phone they've heard me talking on the phone and they pinged me for that shut up so uh, I needed the mouse for some reason I needed the mouse I've got it now <laughs> tonight on Mental Health Monday we're doing homesickness homesickness that's just some words that just this is someone else's thing about homesickness it's nice it's interesting I found that it's, we're going to have a look it's about food that one it's about food. There's some interesting uh, chicken look crisps. Don't eat chicken. You can eat crisps. This is a picture of Stormtrooper. It's quite a good picture. We're gonna have that as our background for some of this. I'm gonna do it like this. Look. Look at that. <laughs> you can even have the credit there, Christina Alexand Alexanderson. I'm not very good at names. Look at that. It's, it's quite a good picture, isn't it? <laughs> Found that on the old internet. It's Copyright Creative Commons. We're here 10 minutes, seven minutes early now. I haven't done the clapper board. You need to do that. Get that done early. Out of the way. Get that done. See if Big Face works. See if Big Face works. There's Big Face. Get that done out of the way. Ah, that's loud. That's done. I've got cake over there. You can't see it. It's there. Trust me. And I wanted to get the chat popped out, so I always nice to get the chat popped out. Get the chat popped, chat popped. And then I shuffle, I always forget to shuffle the windows. Chat, you've been popped. You've been shuffled. Just a little bit there, you go, yeah, shuffled. Chat popped and shuffled. Ob's in the main window there, That's, I can see me talking. I can switch between them with this click of a button, web of a browser. That's the web of a browser, as far as you're concerned. As far as I'm concerned, I can read all about homesickness and these other windows. Well, you just look at that picture. That's an improvement. <laughs> and we've got oh, all of six minutes for me to fill before I go into the intro and start talking homesickness. So I did want to... I oh, see, now I want to use the internet. <laughs> Switch between the windows. It's... This one, yeah. And... Uh, Got Mental Health Monday as a general background. I was going to talk about Afghanistan. We're going to do that as part of the actual episode, though, aren't we? So maybe I'll just not do that yet. Just put this one up for now. Mental Health Monday. There's our YouTube channel. Oh, that's what I was saying. Computer's been chugging away, but I did get the edit done. I've got some other bits and pieces of the edits, like little cuts, but I haven't got them all uploaded because it took so long for them to chug out of the edit. <laughs> this week, I think we're going to try and do an hour on... Uh, on what you call it homesickness so that I can edit it quicker and get onto the actual internet and also uh, there's our channel anyway Mental Health Monday it's a good channel it's got content it's got like 
if you press videos there you can see all the, all of them and they are building up now look look at that they are building up now quite a few of them now aren't there some funky fun thumbnails it's generally me talking generally me talking but what we're working up to this year what we're aiming for working up to we've discussed before in, in the past as part of the patreon thing and what we're working up towards is getting this part of the room over there set up like a podcast studio getting the microphones and things getting things working maybe even investing in zoom prior to that starting to do some interviews getting that sort of thing rolling the interview talking thing so that's something that's going to come all good in the hood uh, and I was going to talk to you a little bit today about what I've been doing in the woods. <laughs> You'll like that, won't you? So I just big face that for a minute. And also here I should have a, a window for my b b browser here, shouldn't I? Which you can have the picture. There you go. Oh, oh that one, the picture. <laughs> Picture's too big. It's covering up my old big face. There's my face, there's the picture. Got it all in combo now. All of that in combo. Cook a combo. So this week I've been in the woods. I had a really good one in the woods this week. <laughs> so there's this field that we got. It's all these grasses. They've been planted as a sort of let the fields rest set. Like I don't know if you know about this concept, but in the UK, not every field is always planted with crops every season. Quite often they'll do a season of growing something they want to harvest. And then the next season, they'll put in a rest crop so it puts more nitrogen back into the soil and the soil doesn't just get depleted by overuse. So this field's been having a rest year and they planted loads of grasses, really. So it's just long grasses. It's pretty cool. And it's been a bit slightly bad weather, so the grass has been pushed down by the, the winds and the rain, which is a bit of a shame for the grasses. But not the dog, who now sees this as a giant trampolini playground. <laughs> It's huge like space and he's the grasses are all like laying down and they're bouncy bouncy bouncy. He absolutely loves it. Absolutely loves it. Gets all bits stuck to him, but he loves it. He loves it, the little chuffer. So doing this and uh, I go around in a big circle. I don't know I don't know why instinctively I walk around. I suppose it's easier for me, isn't it, to walk around the edges where things are a little more sparse rather than straight through the middle of all this bouncy grass. But I walk around the edges and he bounces around as whatever. And I've gone all the way around all the way up a bit of a hill all the way along there's a bit of a fallen tree blocking the path a little bit it's not really a path it's just the edge of a field and as we're approaching this bit of a fallen tree i see and i'm i'm sharp to this i'm wise the grasses are high but there's some little ears <laughs> some little ears. it's not my dog my dog's bouncing around behind me up ahead there's some little ears so i'm dying stopped i'm like whoa what's that get down and I have a look there's some more little ears. i think there's three sets Six ears, three sets. You're here again. It's a different one. It's, <laughs> it's a different one. Want to become famous? Do you think I'd be telling people my story about the little ears in the woods if I wanted to become famous? I'd be busy like Mr. Beast, locking myself in a box for 48 hours with the world's largest, goldest ice cream in a Lamborghini in the world's biggest house, falling off a giant cliff in the desert, riding a shark. <laughs> That's the path to fame. What I'm on here is something different. <laughs> You've thrown me off course. Look, these little ears were poking out. These little ears were poking out. Just above the grasses. So I said, Milo, hang on. Because I know he likes to chase these things. I've said, Milo, hang on. And I'm trying to keep it down. If I talk loud, they'll hear me. They've got their ears. That's what they're looking. They're not looking. They're, their ears like that are because they've heard something. And they want to see, what, have I heard something? So you've got to be quiet when they're look, looking for you with their ears, listening for you. There were three little muntjacks, probably a slightly older one, mommy muntjack. Two little slightly smaller ones, baby muntjack. They weren't baby babies, but young little. They're little muntjacks, like little deer. They're like little deer, like a little, like probably the size of a dog, a reasonable, bigger than my dog. But, you know, not as big as a horse. Definitely normal deer aren't as big as a horse, are they? Smaller than a normal deer. You'd think they were baby deer if you hadn't ever seen them <laughs> so that's who was there just over the just over the furrow just over the above in the long grass fallen tree that's who was there just over there so i said to mine look you over there go on you go on you 
and he starts running after them. <laughs> he loves it. And they scatter, because there's three of them. So they scatter. And Marlowe's running off, bouncy, bouncy. And they've got long legs, firm paws. So they bounce, spring, spring, spring through this long grass. And my lovely, beloved Marlowe, he's got a... <laughs> He's got a good way. What he does is he copies these these springy leg deer. So he runs and he does jump like that. So he goes run run jump run run jump. So he's springing off to them and then he falls in the grass because he can't keep up with them because they're much more powerful and ad adapted and adept at this task of running through these long grass. So they're away and he's running around the fields after them. I'm round to the fallen tree and I said to myself, look, he's off that way. The deer are off in all directions. He's going to come back. He's not. I'm not worried with Marlow. He comes back. He's not going to run off into the road somewhere or back down the path and try and get in the car and drive off and leave me in the woods. He's all right. He's going to. He's going to just run around after the deer. And when he finds out they've they've abandoned, him, like they've they when he finds out they've left him for dust, he'll abandon the chase and, and return. So I'm sat just on the fallen tree, slightly on the path, just like just chilling, really. Just chilling, and then uh, up from where I was walking, up from behind me, <laughs> comes the little munchak, the little deer. He's a dopey little. I don't know. I was just sat really still, and he's just come trotting up, and I'm just sat really still, and he's just come trotting up. And as he gets to about within a foot of me, I've said, "You're right." <laughs> he's run. And at this point, Marlo's coming up the other way from back from where he was coming. He's seen me talking to this Mister Deer. He's run after it. <sighs> Yeah, that was a good go in the woods, that was. Oh, it's it's officially. <laughs> okay, you ready? <laughs> you want to see the little baby deer? Oh, yeah, I should, do you know what? I should have taken a photo, but when I was sat there just waiting for Marlo to return, I didn't get my phone out and do it. I was just being in the woods, just chilling. And when I saw the deer, I don't, I, it's not even my first thought is to get my phone out and have a photo. I probably got some somewhere. You, you get these photographs of, you know, things on the telephone. I don't know why I show the phone like that. I don't want to show it. You know what a phone is. <laughs> when you get the uh, <laughs> when you get these photographs of things in the woods, like you see them in your eyes, and they're like magnificent. You've seen them, like when you get a photograph, it's like really little, small, and it's only a few pixels on the thing. And you're like, it's there in the grass. That's it. That's the thing. It's never you, you don't get the same don't get the same impression. But yeah, Milo had a good go. That was a good go in the woods. So we saw the the deer. That's something I've done this week. There was another. Th there was another Marlow-related woods deer. So he got covered in bits as well, Marlow, because he was running through all this grass. He got covered in bits, absolutely covered in them. I had to pick all these bits off and comb all these bits off. I spent like hours picking bits off him. Then at the end of the evening, so <laughs> I probably I've even got bits of seed and dog hair on the desk in front of me here from an evening picking and. Anyway, look, hi, you're with Scott. This is Mental Health Monday. It's midnight, it's always midnight. It's Monday, it's always Monday, it's 8pm GMT, this is right here on your left ear, it's mono. It's this ribbon microphone, but, it's a, but I put this on top of it. Nigel was asking, I just put that on. It makes it look like space age. <laughs> it's like a pop shield. And today we're talking about home sweet home. We're talking about homesickness. That's what we're doing. I've got some interesting stuff to look at. It's mainly Wikipedia for me. I've got that in the window, so you can keep looking at the picture that's nice. Where's the web of a browser? Uh, this is what I'm looking at. <laughs> All words that are horrible. <laughs> you can look at the big picture. That's nice, isn't it? Stormtrooper, Death Star, home sweet. It's ironic, isn't it? Ironic. Is it? I don't know. The Death Star blows things up anyway. So, And uh, we're going to talk about homesickness. And I also wanted to go web up a browser for this. Because this week... Now, I don't know if you've been following in the news. <laughs> the whole world of horror that the news seems to be managed to splurge out for us every week. It's not just the old COVID this week. They've gone quiet on the COVID in the news this week. They've gone quiet for that. What they've decided this week... Actually, where are you? Look, where's the where's the chat here? You should be able to see that on this. Uh, I 
I can do I can get your chat to come up to on top order edit there look order move to top chat window capture oh, I don't know where it is should be there anyway look while we're on the web browser web browser for some reason you can't be seen anymore chat window capture hang on edit order move to top oh you're there but you're just really little how's that happened hang on that, that can't be right chat window capture I can do this like this look no you must be there somewhere mustn't you <laughs> it's okay chat doesn't want to be famous I can tell you what chat's saying <laughs> I can't do I can't do that I've got to have a chat window capture on the old stream haven't I if I, if I go to big face this look you're on the big face there there you are chat window capture 2 you're called if I copy that copy go to web of a browser and just paste it there you go look <laughs> fixed I see I'm getting so much better at this so look this week in the news it's not just been the horror of uh, the COVID, which they've gone quiet about in our country. In our country, we've got to that level now where no one seems to care anymore, where a certain amount of deaths a day is just how many it is. It's like driving, I think, in a way. It's funny, isn't it? Because everyone just goes about driving. But, you know, a certain level of deaths a day, well, it's driving, isn't it? So that's where we're up to with that. <laughs> and beyond now, this is something we've got to have a quick... This is why we're going to talk about homesickness in a way today. But uh, the old... Look, the Taliban... Chuff you now, the Taliban. I'm not going to go over the whole, you know, the whole shebang with this, am I? I'm not going to explain all that to you, but basically, we've all gone home. <laughs> 20 years, what I find interesting about this article on the BBC about this war in Afghanistan, 2001 to present. 2001. So in 2000, that's like, what are we on now? 20 years ago. 20 years ago, right? We all went out there because someone did some bombing in our countries. This is general, isn't it? It was, what was it, 9-11, and in our country we had the, the they call it the subway in America, but we call it the tube. They were blowing up things. Look, they were blowing up the bombs. Or maybe, maybe it was the CIA doing it so that we thought it was them so that they could do all these things. <laughs> maybe Eminem flew the, planes into the Twin Towers to sell his latest album. Look, there was conspiracy theories abound, but what ended up happening, regardless of who did what, was we went out there to shut them down, stop that Taliban, that bad Taliban. <laughs> the Afghan people, some of them were like, thanks, and other people were like, what are you doing here? Who are you? And in general, 20 years later, <laughs> we decided, look, we've had enough. People have had their legs blown off. People have died. I'm not even joking about this part. This part's serious. I'll do big face for it because it's that serious. People have had their legs blown off. People have been killed on both sides. Kids have been killed. That's, you know, web, web of a browser again, thanks. But we decided we had, had enough. We're going home. England have gone home. America have gone home. And if you live there and you're not in favour with the Taliban, you'd better go home too. Except you can't because you live there. <laughs> so you better get out. And a lot of people, this is... Um, chaos at the airport these are people well, these are people like you know normal people like you and me they're all trying to get on the planes and literally on the planes which that can't be a good idea can it that's not a good look you're not gonna <laughs> I mean what <laughs> I'm joking now at this stage about something like insane and tragic but like in the background look, things have been blown up and stuff but what are you gonna I get it you want to all get on the aeroplane but not literally on the aeroplane because <laughs> you can't hold on it will take you being or I don't know if there's an element of because uh, it looks like they're all trying to get on the aeroplane I don't know if there's an element of maybe sort of celebratory rebellion amongst some people there's tragic footage of people falling off planes midair well there you go I mean I wondered if they were just sort of like you know you know how they all come out on the streets and get on top of the American 
uh, imagery, like getting on top of an American airplane, like, way, we're taking our country back, way, you know, if it was something like that concept for, to some people. But I don't know, like, it just seems mad, doesn't it? But you maybe, if you're in that situation, you do what things that I would seem to think would be mad. Women have disappeared from Afghan TV. I mean, there's going to be problems with the country and how it's run now again, isn't there? <laughs> And far be it for me to suggest that when I was a kid, you see, we watched the A, a team on the telly. Now, if you're in trouble, <laughs> you don't know where to turn. You're, and you really turned to the A team, didn't you? That's what I learned when I was a kid. Well, the A team have been there, they've been there for 20 years. And I know it's simplistic to say it now, but maybe we should have set up some sort of. You know, maybe we should have made sure that the people had a say and a vote and a security and all that before we left. But the A team need to go in. We are the A team. I don't know. I actually feel like, in some ways, we'll get on to homesickness just after I just say a little bit because, you know, talking about it. I feel like, in some ways, it is okay that we go there and provide security as a, not America, not England, but the united group of worlds, you know, all of us that are generally peaceful and good willing. And like we go there as a mixed group and say, look, we're going to help your government if your government is not going to do bad things. We're just going to help them to provide stability and security. You can make the decisions. You can vote for the government. You can. We'll make sure the elections are fair and free. You know, oh, hello. Angela Merkel just popped up. I don't know. Oh, it's because it's live news on a feed. <laughs> don't need to know what's live about the Angela Merkel. Forget her. Forget her. Let's go back to the old... There we are, look. Life in Kabul after the Taliban victory. It's bad. For, for most, for some. I don't know, if you're the fellow with the gun, maybe you don't feel like it's bad. And I also should say this, this is important to say. Uh, Afghanistan has a rich history of fighting off invaders from their their native land. Like, that's their cultural history. And the Soviets invaded them. And like, obviously in America, you know about the Soviets and they're invading and all that. You know, you don't want that, do you? So we sort of helped them to fight them off. Like we created this sort of fighting force. These They called themselves the students. That's what Taliban sort of translates to. So in a way, they kind of feel like this is their country. They live there. <laughs> the, the Soviets have come. They fought them off. And then the Americans have come. And like, if you're not that educated, you don't know that much. And you just listen to what maybe certain people tell you. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe for certain people, they feel like, look, this is our country. And these are my guns. And, you know, this is how I want to live. I don't know. But I do think that we should have this ability to, to provide the average citizen everywhere with the basic human rights that we believe they should have. And in order to do that, just some stability and some security. And like we've got all this American and English and European weaponry and you know forces and arms and all that. And like we don't have to go around killing people, but we could just provide the stability, couldn't we? And then say, if this is what you vote for, this is what you get. And if when we go away, you come in with your guns, we'll come back and just say, no, mate, sorry. <laughs> it can't be done with guns. If the people vote for you, fair enough. Do what you want. But if they don't vote for you, then like chuff off your chuffers. I don't know. So anyway, it's bad over there. I feel a bit sad about it being bad. And I do feel a bit defeated in that I've followed that conflict. I've seen the, for, you know, I've watched the documentaries. I've seen the people with their legs blown off. Felt the sadness for that on both sides and then it's all for what for 20 years of bloodshed for nothing so you can just see how to say like <laughs> see you then <laughs> you you have a go now i mean a lot of these a lot of these bad people the bad people that have done some terrible things in the, the bad taliban will have just sort of said oh you know i hid in the woods for ages hid in the hills and now the Americans have gone, so... <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is to that anyway. I don't know. Like I said, I think the best answer I've got is the Global Freedom Force. And the Global Freedom Force should just be... Just... It, you should have a... Like, like, you know, set up a set... If things are going wrong, we'll set up... We're down there now. Like, like we've done, in a way, with these other wars and stuff. But we're down there now. We've got our freedom force. We're not leaving. We're setting up. We're sorting it out. And when it's all set up on your side and you're happy, then we'll go. And, like, you know what? If you all vote for us to go now, chuff it, then we will. But, uh, you know. <laughs> you spread that out and get everyone 
at least having drinking water and education choices right so if you don't have education and choices and drinking water what you're doing is you're getting and you're chuffing away you're running running off flights are grounded you're running away look you're climbing the walls you're running away people are fleeing so homesickness that's what we're talking about today homesickness where's my picture <laughs> chat window capture which one are you looking at is that you oh Oh, chat, not chat window. I want blah, 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 browser. There you go. You can have your picture. Like that. There you go. Look, you can have your picture. And I'll do some talking about homesickness. Because a lot of people are going to be feeling homesick, aren't they now? And you know what? Mental Health Monday. We, we all feel homesick at times, I would guess. Unless you never leave home. <laughs> So I'm going to use uh, twi Twitch, Wikipedia. I'm going to use the old wiki. I'm going to use the old wiki. And it's quite good, this Wikipedia, this one. And it leads us to some interesting places. So what the chuff. If you want to see it, if you get cross, you let me know. Otherwise, you've got a nice picture. And I'll do some reading about homesickness. I'm going to start, I'm going to miss out some chuff, so I'm not going to read all the chuff, but diagnosis and epidemiology. Oh, there's loads of big words on Wikipedia, loads of big words, you'll love this. Whereas separation anxiety disorder is characterised by inappropriate and excessive fear or anxiety coming, bleh, see, already, <laughs> is characterised by inappropriate and excessive fear or anxiety concerning separation from those to whom the individual is attached. Symptoms of homesickness are most prominent after a separation and include both depression and anxiety, which is interesting, isn't it? Because we talk about both those things and it's interesting that something as simple as being away from home, which most of us have experienced, can give us those feelings which are relative... Like, what I'm trying to say is it gives us a way that we can all relate to depression and we can all relate to uh, anxiety and and those sorts of things, yeah. God, there's a lot of words. If I lose my place, I've got to find where it is on the old computer screen. That's a tough one for me now. It's all very bright, isn't it? The computer screen. Uh, and there's a lot of tough words here for me, but I'll just go with homesickness is the distress or impairment caused by an actual or anticipated separation from home. Its cognitive hallmark is preoccupying thoughts of home and attachment objects. Recent pathogenic models suggest the possibility homesickness reflects both insecure attachment and a variety of emotional and cognitive vulnerabilities, such as previ little previous experience away from home and negative attitudes about the no novel environment citation needed. Pathogenic models. I wonder what a pathogenic model is. Uh, pathogen, isn't that when you have something that makes you sick? Reasons for your sickness emotional vulnerability so what they're saying is if you don't have much ex experience being away from home so if it's novel if it's new to you and if you're worried about it you've got negative attitudes about the environment that you're going to they've used the word novel that's where i got that from uh, so if you think the place you're going to be going to is not as good as home and you prefer to be at home then you're more potentially more likely to get sick or they're the things that are going to make you more homesick the prevalence of homesickness varies greatly depending on the population studied and the way homesickness is uh, yeah. and the way homesickness is measured. One way to conceptualise homesickness prevalence is as a function of severity. What they mean is there. <laughs> Why do they use these long words when they just could say what they mean? One, what they mean is is that you can find out about how wide homesickness is across all people by measuring how much they feel it. <laughs> so the absolute prevalence of homesickness is close to 100% in a mild form, they say. And this comes from studies, so they don't just say this. This is from a study by Thurber Patterson. And this is a good thing about Wikipedia, isn't it? It can show you the studies. I thought we'd do the overview, and then maybe one day we'll look deeper into the studies. So I thought maybe that. Gives us more to look at, doesn't it? <laughs> I'll keep picking bits out, chatting about them. I've got my cake down there if I get hungry as well. 
How am I going to edit this if I keep jibbling on? Look, chuffing, chuffling on. What I was saying there, homesickness is close to 100%. It means that everyone feels homesickness in their study. Everyone, mostly in a mild form, but everyone has said they f they find some form of homesickness. Roughly 20% of university students and children at summer camp rate themselves at or above the midpoint of homesickness severity. So they would say they're like, you know, more than average homesick, at least 20% of uni students and children at summer camp. And this is where it's important because most children go to summer camp, don't they? Most of us, when we're kids, through some sort of schooling or church or, or whatever it is, you know, through some sort of project have to go away scouts maybe have to go away from our home and spend some time in an environment that we perceive to be as lower grade than home. you know it's not I, I remember thinking about scout camp well I don't fancy sleeping in a tent at night in the woods in the cold and I don't fancy using the not a toilet in the woods and I don't fancy using the not a bathroom to clean my teeth you know I don't fancy that <laughs> Sounds better at home, doesn't it, where I've got my, my Super Nintendo. So looking forward to these projects, <laughs> you know, that's part of the homesickness problem, wasn't it? It said earlier that if you're already feeling negative about the new environment and you don't have much experience being away from home, you might get more homesick. And so now we're saying that at least twenty, at least 100% of everyone feel, felt some form of homesickness and at least 20% of children have felt it in a strong or above average way. Only 5% of campers report intense homesickness in line with anxiety or depression. So only 5 to 7 people say it's that bad that it's depression. But in adverse or painful environments, such as the hospital or battlefield, intense homesickness is far more prevalent. And that's interesting, isn't it? That's it. That's my little catchphrase, isn't it? That's interesting, isn't it? Got the battle star up there. On the battlefield, because we talked about the Taliban, it's not just the people that are leaving Afghanistan in terms of the people that... How do I put this? It's not just the, the native people, the Afghans, who... Afghanis? I don't know what the right, correct term is, so I'm not trying to be um, racist by saying an incorrect word there. But uh, I don't know... You know, they're going to feel homesick they're leaving their home through being a refugee or whatever... But also the soldiers that have been there, they've been feeling homesick the whole time they're there. The soldiers, like the American ones that we sent out or the English ones that we sent out or the, whatever you want to call it, you know, they're, they're feeling homesick. That's interesting, isn't it? They're feeling homesick on the battlefield and that's a mental health issue. And you're asking them to go into these environments that are definitely negative, definitely preferable to be at home. You know, it's interesting, isn't it? In one study, 50% of children scored themselves at or above the midpoint on a numerical homesickness intensity scale compared to the 20% at summer camp. So another study said even more of them, sometimes to the point of suicidal misery. So, so now we're saying that uh, homesickness can actually be that serious that it leads to... Oh, I forgot. Every single chuffing week I do this, don't I? Every week. We're on the web of a browser. Where's my Windows? <laughs> You'll love this. You love this. Where am I going now with this homesickness? And we need to do the uh, the old Samaritans, don't we? Samaritans. If you are at crisis point, if you are feeling that homesick, that you are uh, feeling suicidal or whatever, you know, if for whatever reason you think I'm at, not usually feeling like this, this is different or chuff it, I'm fed up of it, there's a number to call. You can talk to somebody immediately. You can talk to us in chat. Yeah. And it, by the way, yeah, it does depend on how you define home. We'll talk about that. We will. We'll talk about that. Uh, and there's Lifeline in America, and there's the helpers. So Lifeline is there. That's the moment. That's you can tell it's American because one eight hundred. I'm laughing. I'm laughing. If you're feeling bad, look, they're smiling. They've called Lifeline, so that's better than topping yourself. Trust me. And there's one for deaf people. That's really good as well, isn't there? Let's drag that down so you can see it. Deaf and hard of hearing there. And in Spanish. So that's good. And there uh, was help us something. Uh, Nigel will have to tell me again another time. <laughs> Mental Health Monday. Fully professional here. Fully professional. 
and we're going you're I'll tell you what you're doing you're going back to the uh, the picture you're going back to that picture there what's going on I can see everything no, yeah you're going back to that picture there I'm going to uh, homesick homesick oh you can see the words down the bottom now a little bit you can see everything all in one brilliant so now we move on to something called risk and protective factors. Risk factors. So this is interesting as well. <laughs> Everything's interesting to me. It's interesting because in other forms of mental health, because we're doing overviews at the moment, we're doing all the different sort of topics, giving overviews, having a little chat about them. And then we're going to look at trying to get some interviews going and maybe looking at deeper studies. That's the, the longer term step by step. But at the moment we're doing overviews. But no, no risk factors have come up yet in overviews have they but yet with homesickness they've thrown that up for us risk factors and that's a good concept i didn't you know with anxiety maybe as well risk factors maybe there are some things that are more likely or more risky in terms of i mean the problem with anxiety is you think about risk all the time don't you you overrate the risk that's why you feel anxious about some things that's why you are more scared of things that maybe don't need that level of response uh learning to this is something we did in one of the early early episodes the anxiety trap learning to rate the risk and say what's the probability of this happening has this happened to me before will it happen in a hundred times what's the you know what's the percentage chance if i bet a tenner on it happening would i lose my money is it going to happen now would i want to bet the tenner do i feel differently about my fear my anxiety now that i've measured out the risk in a different way you know, those sort of ideas. And also the worry tree. Can I do something about this? If so, yes. If not, distract myself. Those sort of things. But we haven't looked at risk factors. Will this activity increase the risk of my panic attack? Are the factors involved that are going to make me potentially more likely to feel depressed? Risk factors. And I brought this up with uh, <laughs> homesickness, which is great because homesickness, as we said earlier... Is something that maybe we all feel, we all feel at some point in our lives, and is completely deeply rooted and associated with depression and anxiety. So maybe we can all get something from learning about this, and all relate to somebody who's feeling anxious or depressed if we learn about this. Risk factors and protective factors construct constructs that decrease the likelihood of homesickness vary by population so it's interesting that they've done the studies and it varies depending on which demographic you're naturally fortunately born into and where you live does make a difference culturally so we're saying that if there's a difference in population maybe it's genetic maybe because populations have different genetic factors but i always believe it to be more cultural i believe it to be more cultural nature nurture debate isn't it but for example seafarers on board the environmental stresses associated with the hospital a military boot camp or foreign country may exacerbate homesickness and complicate treatment so if you're homesick and you're going through something really <laughs> stressful like a military boot camp or being on a boat then that's going to complicate it but generally speaking risk and proactive effect oh look Risk and proactive factors transcend age and environment. So we all experience these. So again, it's something human to all of us. Great. I like it. They fall into five categories, the risks. Experience, personality, family, attitude and environment. More is known about some of these factors in adults, especially personality factors, because more homesickness research has been performed with older populations. It's one of those things, isn't it? It's one of those things. The more you study, the more you know. So, but it means that you can talk about it more. We end up talking about it more because we've got these things. When you create media products, they draw on things like this. The study gets done, and you see a hundred, you know, different websites, different headlines trying to grab a click. But the things we don't know about might equally be as powerful or important, but we just haven't studied them as much. But yeah, we've got some information, so that's cool. And if you look at the wikipedia which you're not allowed to because i'm doing the reading but <laughs> it does give uh, the wiki, wiki homesickness does give obviously all these different citations that you can go and look at and we will one day look at together anywho 
a growing body of research is elucidating the what is elucidating the etiology so some people who write on wikipedia just love the, the words don't they they love the words elucidating making clear if you wanted to make things clear you just write more clear language because everyone's got to read this not just the people that can elucidate the meaning from the difficult words into simple etiology a growing body of research is elucidating the etiology etiology i guess must mean you know how where it comes from <laughs> of homesickness in younger populations i'm gonna have to copy uh copy and then just i'm just gonna have to just go into the old google and just find out what it means because you know i can't just be ignorant all my life etiology the cause set of causes of a manager of causation of a disease or condition it where it come from <laughs> where it come from so if you i can edit wikipedia can't i? I should edit that to say a growing body of research is finding out the cause of homesickness in younger populations not elucidating the etiology elucidating the etiology i can't even say the chuffing thing this is a good tip scott's top tips you'll love this top top tip if you're writing and you're doing it for a, a job interview or a you know if you've got your grammarly forget your grammarly <laughs> If you're trying to do your grammarly, you've got your thing, you're writing, and you're writing for someone, don't try and impress them with etiology of elucidating, unless they are a, you know, Choxford professor, Chuffington Smythe, Chuffington, unless they're writing a Chuffing dictionary themselves, and they're going to get a kick out of that, don't do that, because if they don't know the words, they'll feel like made small a little bit, won't they? <laughs> see don't you they, they all love my hair they all love my hair hello Nigel <laughs> yeah you can see that I dyed it more because it's looking more orange as the days wear on <laughs> blue makes it look less orange So, but trust me it's orange we're going for a sort of muck orange on that I don't know why I don't know why the doggy's doing some chuffing now heard me talking about chuffers but listen if and I've, I've been saying this all episode but look this isn't a new microphone I only figured it out after we got off last week this is a pop shield and i just put it on there it just looks better it just looks new <laughs> but yeah so uh if you're writing for somebody and they're going to get a kick out of the writing then give it the the eluc elucidating the etiology but if it's just for somebody that wants to understand you and if especially if you're going to be working together like you want to know like if i was reading the resume you say in america don't you the resume the cv curriculum vitae vitae if I, if I was reading the piece of paper that they'd written me and it was like all about elucidating that i think oh this is going to be a difficult chuff to work with isn't it and they're going to be going on with all their like pretentious highbrow making me feel small all the time if i don't know the words i'm going to feel small so i'm going to have to get the dictionary out and i think well i'm not employing this person who makes i'm the boss <laughs> i'm not employing this person who makes me feel small even if it shows their intelligence and they'd be good at the job you know unless we're working in the dictionary corner and they need to, you know, exactly the word clear. And that's why it's so funny as well, isn't it? Because it makes it less clear to use the word elucidating. It makes it less clear. <laughs> Muddies the water for me, mate, unless you know what they're saying. So I don't know. I think it's better to use plain English. And then another context. So that's one context. Another context is if you're writing for other people to read, which is wide context, isn't it? Wide. Let's say you're writing a sign <laughs> and you want to make sure people don't go in the water. Yeah. What, what you, what's your top 10 words that you're going to want on that sign I'm pretty sure that don't and water are going to fit if you're writing elucidating you know elucidate your way around the water please it, they're going to be all in the water they're going to keep off the grass good sign says what it means <laughs> doesn't it keep off the grass not on the grass stay off it's, it's, look so they've even gone as far as just stop <laughs> stop not stop this and that just stop <laughs> That's a good one. Stop. So, boiling it down, simple concepts. It actually is a good con good con concept. Use clear language, especially if people are going to want to read it and understand it. They'll enjoy it more. They'll get what you mean more. Easy, straight away, quick words, concepts, simple. If you're going into something hard, you know, if you're doing a documentary for BBC Four and it's going to be all about the spoken word and Chaucer, then maybe go into some clever words but for this this is wikipedia and i'm trying to tell you about risk factors homesickness and it's only making it more difficult for me <laughs> me right
so look, <laughs> we've done me. We've done me. Let's carry on. Risk factors. We didn't get to them yet. We didn't get to them. All we found out was that they uh, were finding out. Right. One, experience factors, younger age. You haven't got as much experience away from home for which age can be a proxy. That, again, clear language, please. I think what they mean there is simply by nature of being young, you haven't got as much experience as being away from home in general. But maybe you have if you're young. You, you still can. But little or no previous experience in a novel environment. Again, you're not more as likely to have experienced different environments. So you don't know as much about them. Little or no previous experience venturing out without primary caregivers. You don't go out on your own. You, people look after you. So if all of a sudden you're booted off to boot camp or summer camp, you're like, oh, hang on, who's going to cook my dinner? <laughs> But these are risk factors. If you've got that, you know, if you're younger, that's a reason you're going to feel more likely homesick, more likely to feel homesick. So I shouldn't joke about it, but I will. I'm going to joke all the way through. I like joking. I bought Crime and Punishment because I recommend, oh gosh, oh, it's heavy. Don't, don't be put off in the initial stages. Here we go now. Here we go. <laughs> big face. Let's go big face. <laughs> don't be put off in the initial stages by some of the... Uh, I, Dostoevsky seems to, <laughs> in my opinion, I don't know if it's warming up, but he does a bit of descriptive language, which can be really good. You know, it can be really elucidating when you're trying to imagine the, the scenery. But he does a bit of descriptive language, and you're kind of thinking like, well, get on with the story, son. Like, don't tell me about the bridge. Get on. Get on. So don't be put off by that. And also, uh, I don't think it's that bad, but also he, the one thing that always plagued me, plagued me, and I did find it out, and I don't know if I'm right because I've forgotten, but there's a place called K Bridge, and it actually is called K Bridge. And I think they named things like, you can find this out yourself on Google when you come up against it in the book, but they named things in different ways in the Soviet era. But it does exist. It is a real place, this, this K Bridge. And I, I kept thinking, why is he abbreviated this? Why can I not... What, what is it to mean something I'm supposed to be <laughs> don't be put off but I mean gosh he gets into some things some like deep dark moments so uh, and I guess I read it when I was a student as well and like when you're struggling <laughs> struggling when you're making pasta and gravy for your dinner for the third night in a row yeah <laughs> but yeah I, I hope you enjoy it Hemingway should have done an edit <laughs> Hemingway I imagine he would have been cross on the editing. He would have been like, cut that out, chop that. I don't know why I always feel like Hemingway's a cross fella. Um, well, am I doing homesickness? Where am I now? Web of a browser. These are the factors that make you more likely to have a risk of homesickness. Attitude factors. The belief, simply the belief that homesickness will be strong. Negative first impressions and low expectations for the new environment. That's come up again, the new environment. It's always this new environment, isn't it? When you get sent off to summer camp, if they th if they hype it up and you think band camp's going to be good, don't worry, <laughs> shit, I'll play me. Play me, you will. If it's good, then in, in that case, in that case, I want to take all the credit when it turns out to be good. When one of the literary classics turns out, shock horror, to actually be good, then I want all the credit. <laughs> don't, Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky, chuff him. He only did the, the thoughts and the writing of the thoughts <laughs> you do the thing in your mind when you read it so most of the credit goes to you and i want 10 percent. i just want to cut a commission <laughs> uh, attitude factors the belief that look <laughs> if you think homes it's going to be bad and you're going to get homesick if you think that band camp is going to be sh i'm just going to swear it then because you well don't get a swear and let's keep with the chuffing if you think it's going to be bad if you think it's going to be far away from home as well, far away, great perceived distance. So there's a factor, perceived distance. Another risk factor, which I've got to edit out of all my chopping chat, personality factors. Insecure attachment relationship with primary caregivers. Low perceived control over the timing and nature of the separation. from. Oh God, one by one in plain English, please. If you're overly, overly attached to your parents, primary caregivers, we'll say parents because that's the majority, no, it's only fair, isn't it? Even if well, primary caregivers, you know, okay, could be a low perceived control over the timing and nature of the separation from home. So if you feel you're not going to control how long you're going to be away and what kind of uh, the nature of the separation or what, 
I guess the activity, what's going to be happening, the reasons, if you're not in control of that. Anxious or depressed feelings in the months prior to the separation. Prior, so that's before. So if you're getting anxious and depressed before. And low self-directedness, high harm avoidance, rigidity, and a wishful thinking coping style. So there's quite a few bundled in there, but they're personality factors, they're calling them. And they're different. So, you know, if you're already a vulnerable personality, oh, it feels like a cake moment for me now. I can see that cake just warming up in its plastic bag. We did that. We have a good cake this week. We made a good one. Should we do family factors? That's the last one before I have to edit out my cake chat. Family factors, decision control, e.g. caregivers forcing young children to spend time away from home against their wishes. So if your family is the reason that you're having to spend time away from home, that's going to be tough, isn't it? But that's natural in a way as well. You've got to go to scout camp. I just need a fucking chuffing weekend on my own. <laughs> right, I'm going to eat my cake for a second. It even smells good. Put extra... Mm. I'll tell you in a minute. I shouldn't have took such a big bite. This week, when I was making it, for some reason, I saw the mix was just too loose. It was just too loose. I thought to myself, this needs more flour. But it doesn't need the sort of measurement, half a cup or whatever. It doesn't need any of that. You just need Scotty Hottie to go in with his hand in the bag of flour. And just a poof. Just poof, the flour. It makes that noise when you drop it. Poof. And it goes. It needs the sort of ad addition of flour where the flour goes everywhere on the work surface. And then you like pick up the fork and there's just an outline of fork in the flour on the work surface. Just that, poof, and then mix it. And then I've got another, poof, with hand. Just drop that in. Mix it till it was when I felt like it was the right consistency. Not with your, you know, not with your recipe. Not with your Mary Berry. Not with your Betty Crocker. None of your recipe. Just what I felt was right. And dang it, it was on the nose. Very nice consistency. Very nice consistency of cake this week. Right. <laughs> Proactive factors against uh, homesickness. Proactive. Now, this is good, isn't it? Because you've got positive things that mean you might feel less homesick. So we can actually work on these before the separation, before the thing that makes you homesick, before you have to go somewhere. We can actually work on these things to toughen ourselves up, to make ourselves more proactive. Unfortunately, they're all the same things. So in the edit, I can just flip the screen and just I'll be saying the same things, but backwards. <laughs> I'll read them. Experience factors. Older age. So being older and having more experience away from home can give you uh, a greater resilience to being homesick previous experience in the new environment having been to different environments before all that sort of thing and being out without your parents that can help isn't that interesting that the things that you that is actually that's blown my mind a little bit the experience factors that held you back before that made you feel more homesick, not having the experience, not being out there, not having seen it, not being out without your mum and dad. <laughs> now, they are the things that make you more strong. So actually, going through it in itself made you strong, didn't it? That's interesting. Attitude factors, the belief that homesickness will be mild or that you've got a positive first impression of where you're going, high expectations for your new environment, perceptions of social support, Low perceived demands, uh, e.g. on academic or vocational performance. Short perceived distance from home. Well, I'm not too far, I can always go home. Do I want to become famous? They always chuff in following me. You must think something, something <laughs> you must think there's something <laughs> up with me because you're always chuffing them, in, you chuffers. Right. But this is interesting. It's basically the way you think about it before you go. And it's hard to, you can't, you can't, you can, you can. It's, it's hard to just say, oh, I'm switching these feelings, I'm going to think better about this, but attempting to work ideas through that might help us to think more positively about the new environment actually leads to feeling better when we get there. So that's really important to note. Personality factors, flexibility, an instrumental coping style, good mental health in the months prior to the separation, high perceived control over the timing and nature. Now that's a good one, high perceived control. So giving people a sense that they have 
control or a choice makes them feel less homesick. High perceived control. And it's perceived control. Maybe you can't change these things. Maybe you can't go home whenever you want. But maybe if you tell them they can. (laughs) Maybe if you tell them they can, they feel better. Family factors. High decision control. So caregivers giving young people a say in the decision to spend time away from home individuals making their own choice about military service supportive caregiving excuse me that's the cake caregivers who express confidence and optimism about the separation have a great time away i know you'll do great so if you yourself as the people who are building the person up to be away is worried and frightened that means when they get there they're going to have a worse time (laughs) So you've got to be optimistic and positive. It's going to be great. Environmental factors. Low cultural contrast. This is a good one. You're not going to feel as homesick if there is a low cultural contrast. So again, with the big words, what they mean is if people speak the same language or you've got similar food that you like or they also play soccer or football... (laughs) whatever it is if it's something that you can key into that is something familiar then even though it's a new environment you're going to feel better about being homesick physical and emotional safety so feeling safe is important i get that a few changes to familiar daily schedule so if you're doing the same sort of things in a different environment but you've got the same schedule that's going to help plenty of information about the new place prior to relocation so yeah lots of information being ready being positive Feeling welcome and accepted in the new place. That's harder to achieve on your own, but it can definitely help, sure. Theories of coping. Coping. What? We're going to talk theories of coping. I'm going to shuffle the words around. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. I'm going to do some reading. Some nice reading. But that cake is so nice, I've got to have another bite. I'll tell you... (laughs) All I did was adjust the ratio of flour. Oh, I'll tell you what else I did. I'll tell you what else I did. I warmed the butter. I warmed the butter on the hob before. Not butter, is it? I'm vegan. What do you call it? Like cooking paste. <laughs> you don't eat margarine these days, do you? Margarine. Do they make it illegal? Do they make it illegal? Fat. Cooking fat. It comes in a tub like butter. I can't believe it's not butter. You know what I mean. I warmed it anyway. I warmed it before I used it. And uh, that meant the mix was slightly looser. That's why I put the more flour in. And also, when I put the chocolate in, this is another thing. When I put the chocolate in, because that butter was warm. I say I can't not say butter. I can't not say it. It's, it's <laughs> I don't say milk for soy milk. I say soya milk. I don't say soya butter. It's not soy. It might be soy. Look, more importantly... It was warm. So when I put the chocolate in, the chocolate melted into the cake. It didn't leave chocolate chips like I usually get. It just melted in to the mix. So maybe that's made a difference. Maybe that's made some sort of difference. No, not good. And I also put a bit of oil in. Because I like oil, olive oil. I, I just think if I'm using all this, I can put a bit of... It's, it's a good one. It's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> Is it going to be a line of cakes? No, Mr. Mr. Kipling makes the best cakes in our country. I could never compare... I'll have to do a video about it sometime when I finish with the beans one. But this week I started writing a, what I did on Fortnite. So this week I started writing. I because I've been grinding the Rick skin because it's free and Rick represents um, adult themes. <laughs> Rick and Morty. So I've been and I wanted to do a little what I discovered by grinding what it's like to grind. Anyway, that's been written and prepared in a way in bullet point form. We'll talk about cakes another time. Theories of coping. Many psychologists argue that research into the causes of homesickness is valuable for three reasons. First, homesickness is experienced by millions of people who spend time away from home. 
Second, severe homesickness is associated with significant distress and impairment. And it actually has some homesick boys and girls complain about stomatic problems and exhibit more internalising and externalising behaviour problems than their non-homesick peers. First year college students are three times more likely to drop out of school than their non-homesick peers. So they're saying that being homesick can give severe knock-on effects in your life. I get that. And third, learning about how people cope with homesickness is a helpful guide to designing a treatment programme. So what they're basically saying is that loads of people suffer from homesickness. It can actually make a significant damage to your life. And by studying it, we can help people to deal with it. So that's why we want to learn how to cope with it. Makes sense. They then go on to talk about learned helplessness. And they've got the actual studies that learn helplessness and control beliefs. Learned helplessness predicts that persons... I can't do all their words. Learned helplessness... <laughs> Learned helplessness is basically that if you don't do things for yourself in your life or you feel that you can't do things for yourself in your life, let's say, for example, uh, instead of driving yourself to places, somebody else always drives you and you're worried about learning to drive the car because it's dangerous and, you know, big, scary vehicle. So you say, oh, I can't drive that. I'm not going to, you know, you learn that you not you're kind of helpless and you have to be driven around places just something like that this sort of behavior in your childhood learned helplessness learning that it's not up to you when and where you drive other people have to do it or i can't do the cooking it just gets delivered to me so you know i'm helpless i can't choose what's for dinner i just have to have what i get fed these the knock-on effects to these sort of concepts from childhood is that let's say you're in a job you don't enjoy or you live in a place you're not happy with and you just say to yourself, well, that's life. I can't do anything about it. You know, I've learned that certain things in life you can't do anything about. So I'm not going to do anything about it. And it turns out there are things in life you can do things about. But it's a matter of perception. It's a matter of... Um, I mean, it's so strange to say it, but some people actually feel that they can't fix certain issues and other people seem to be able to fly ahead and, you know, just do that. Uh, this is the concept of learned helplessness anyway. So uh, that you learn that you're helpless or you infer that you're helpless at a young age. So at a later age, you don't push for promotion. You don't um, send off those application forms for the next job, for the better job. You don't move to the other place and follow your dreams because you've learned that you can't. You know, if you've decided through internalising this concept of learned helplessness that you can't do much about it. Web browser. So that's what they say, but they say it in big words. And there's some really good articles about it, actually, that are really good um, and about stress. And some really good people have done the, art, uh, the research, so it's worth looking into, and we'll do deeper dives in the future. But ways of coping. This is what we're going to push towards so we know that we need to form a coping strategy and we know that uh, learned helplessness is one aspect of this homesickness that people believe they can't change things so they get into these situations where they feel homesick or depressed and that's how you just feel when you're at uni or that's how you just feel when you're at camp so i can't do anything about it I can't get my home home any quicker i just have to sit it out but actually there are things you can do about it to make yourself feel better ways of coping and these aren't just off the top of my head these are from the factual source of all knowledge wikipedia but uh, they've got you know a study from thurber and weiss you can try you can just give up the impact of perceived control and coping style on childhood homesickness so it's literally a study on this <laughs> and these are their stratagems excuse me using the big words these are their ideas Line of cakes. Maybe I should do a line of cakes, though. You know, I wonder if you, I wonder if you can give cake away on Patreon, because you would you'd be blown away. Sort of working around the egg issue, <laughs> which is an issue. Let's be fair. Let's be fair. Right, let's be fair. You can't bake properly without eggs. I mean, you can. You do. You're vegan, so you do. But it's an issue. <laughs> we try things. We try things. Bit of a fan of the use of banana at the moment. It helps a bit, but. 
just a fan of the use of banana in general. Just put banana in most of my cakes. Look. <laughs> yeah, no, I substitute. Uh, one of the other ones is aquafaba. I don't know if you, uh, aqua, when you have a can of chickpeas, there's water in it, and it, people are like, oh, that's horrible water. It's all gooky. But actually, that water contains a lot of um, gloopy, gloopy joiny. So that that goes well, and apple sauce and banana as well. Apple sauce and banana in varying quantities. But this is the problem: is it's not a straight one-to-one -one swap, is it? So you end up just sloshing things around in the quantities until you get a sort of cakey mixture. Look, and I never write down what and which. So look, ways of coping. This is how we're going to cope with homesickness, and the cake's going to come into it. Actually, the cake's going to come into it. I'll move it. Look, you can actually see it now. There, I'll move it there. Look, ways of coping. You can see it. Look at that for a finally got there. <laughs> Windows all organized. There's me in the corner doing the talking, looking at the thing that we're talking about. Nice picture. You're there in the corner having a chat. It's all it's all all popped off. It's all working. It's all working. I haven't seen Capital K today, but he's probably working himself. So I just wanted to say hello to him. And I also wanted to say hello to some people that <laughs> I want to say hello to you if you're not talking in chat, but you engage with the content ever i mean that number of people is dwindling <laughs> but we're going to work towards making it increase aren't we we're going to work, to work towards making it increase so i did want to say hello to you just you know who you are if you're uh nathan the wild hog or if you're um carla or tree or i, I mentioned these names because i recognized them have popped up because they've burned into my memory but you know way back we had dr barbarian didn't we and adam and you know if you're any of these people or you know your name isn't burned into my memory from youtube comments in that way but you are thinking oh, why isn't he saying my name well i am i'm thinking of you just wanted to say hi just wanted to say hi just um not subscribe and click like and share and just just hi <laughs> that's what was on top of my mind there hi ways of coping look let's do this the most effective ways of coping with homesickness is mixed and layered mixed coping is that which involves both primary goals oh, the words again primary goals the main what you're trying to do <laughs> your main thing that you want to do changing circumstances and secondary goals adjusting to circumstances so i get that that's quite interesting though that mixed coping you might want to think i don't want to be homesick so i want to go home that's your primary goal that might be achievable but it might not and that's the context that we're talking about today afghanistan the death star being blown up you can't go home sometimes i could tell you all my home stories from when i was a kid about how i felt about homes and how <laughs> through divorce they were sold and i had to move out and i didn't feel the same homesick for things that you can't ever go back to homesick for concepts that you can't ever return to yeah homesick uh, and the secondary goal is coping with that homesickness so layering coping is that which involves more than one method which i think is all of coping isn't it you can't just say i'm only <laughs> today i'm just using this method and the other methods not for they're all happening at the same time this kind of sophisticated coping <laughs> is learned through experience i guess sophisticated is a good word there because naive children might not be able to use more cognitive coping strategies i'm, I'm using big words now you see myself but what we're saying is that if you're not that you know if you're not that grown up you're not that sophisticated sophisticated it's a long word for being able to hold these big ideas and concepts in your head and big thinking you know maybe you just need something simple and uh learned ex sophisticated coping is learned through experience so maybe you haven't got the experience to teach you these big concept ideas that maybe you don't need to worry about so much at the moment such as brief periods away from home or parents uh, an example of mixed and layered coping one study revealed the following method goal combinations <laughs> god could you imagine could you imagine could you imagine just having to go to lunch with this chuffer i bet they've written who they are as well on the i bet it says doesn't it, it should do shouldn't it on wikipedia say who wrote this wikipedia or, uh, edited on 25th of may no it doesn't doesn't say who edited it i'm sorry if this is you i'm sorry if i'm critiquing your edit and you feel bad about it on mental health monday i'm sorry but uh could you imagine going for dinner so 
where would you like to go? Or I'd like to go to an establishment, an establishment, a, a purveyor of fine goods and where service is equal to, if not greater than four celestial bodies on <laughs> the TripAdvisor. I can't even keep, you know, I can't keep doing it like, on the TripAdvisor. So where would you like to go to dinner? And then, like, you know, you get there and they'd be like, could, would you like a menu? I can't even, could, would, you, would you like, could you imagine this Chufford? Would you like a menu? <laughs> Can I interest you with a list of the delectable delights on our, on offer? You know, could, could I just have the menu? <laughs> just, oh, look, anonymous subbies, we. That's like me going down a slide. We <laughs> that one. We've had anonymous sub in before where it was like little mice tooting horns. That was me going down a slide. We let's go back to the ways of coping. So I'm coping with this ways of coping. Well, I'll try and make it. I'll make it understandable. So the following method goal combinations. The method goal combinations. The things you're trying to do. <laughs> are the most frequent and effective ways for boys and girls. They happen, they're most useful and you do them the most. So doing something fun, that's better. Oh, look, there's words I can understand. There's words I can understand. Doing something fun, observable method. To forget about being homesick, secondary goal. So basically, you have some fun, you cheer yourself up and it ain't as bad. Now that sounds silly, doesn't it? That sounds silly. Oh, look, we've got another one. <laughs> We got another one. Oh, I haven't got. A, didn't prepare an emotion or response. Just other than the, the cheer and delight, the cheer and delight. Going to be getting on the internet more this week. I really am trying hard to do that. I'm not going to chug the edit. I'm not going to chug the edit. I'm just going to get on this week and see what happens. So you might see me in, in in the week. Doing something fun is a way of like if you're out there. I want to talk to you now. If you're feeling homesick and you're out there. This might get chopped onto the front of the edit, you never know. I want to talk to you if you're out there and you're homesick. There are ways of getting through it. We're going to look at them today. And one of them, it turns out, is doing something fun. So this episode will be fun. I'm already having it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like it seems silly, doesn't it? But I remember times where I've been homesick, where I've been away at these places, where just the concept of being there has made me feel sad. Um, I don't really feel myself. I don't really feel like I want to do stuff. But maybe they've had a little board game. You know, maybe they've had a little board game in the box there that, that looks a bit... Can we... Maybe, you know, maybe there's a video that you haven't watched before around your friend's house. Maybe, you know, maybe the alien environment has some opportunity. Doing something fun. Forget about being homesick. That's a good one. Because also, we talked earlier about how one of the big problems is your perception of this new environment. Not whether the new environment actually is better or worse, but your perception of it. And it can be... Uh, objectively worse and you can perceive it to be better to be more fun in ways you that's that's a possibility it can be objectively worse and you can perceive it to be worse so what we're going to try and do is find ways to make it more fun and then that's going to change the way you think about the new environment so that's important thinking positively and feel grateful to feel better so it's a silly but simple concept is to feel grateful. Listing things you feel happy about and that you're grateful for. I remember being in places where <laughs> I remember being on a uh, camp once where the water was brown and the, uh, you know, there were things that I wasn't. Like, oh God! I tell you what. I tell you what. The great. This is a great story with the Polish b -b -b big face. This is before I was vegan as well. Before veganism, Polish camp for fencing there for six weeks. The first week. We were given these sausages for breakfast. It was like salad and sausages. And I don't have salad and sausages for breakfast. And I certainly don't have these sausages. They were, we referred to them as killer sausages. Because <laughs> they just looked so... And what they chewed so... And there was... Like, we were given one of these sausages each as standard. And with a bit of salad. Nobody had this. We didn't want to eat those. I didn't like them. And I remember as well, they had iced tea. Iced tea. Not hot tea in a cup with milk like we drink in the UK, like I'm used to, but cold tea. <laughs> cold tea in a jug with lemon. And and again, this was passed around as an opportunity at breakfast. I tried a little glass. I wasn't, I was like, I don't like this. So that first breakfast, I didn't really eat my sausage. 
had a bit of my salad wasn't that into my salad either wasn't really that you know that wasn't for me and didn't really drink my cold tea <laughs> and then I remember the last week after six weeks <laughs> I remember the last week because at this point you know you've eaten all your sandwiches that you've took with you you've, you've run out of sweetie sweets you're down to the bare bones it's the last week you're on your up the last week I was hungry for breakfast we've been training for six weeks they served us killer sausages I remember it and I thought this is those killer sausages again I'll have two <laughs> I'd have two, I'd have two of them. I'd just chuff them down, rrr, give me the salad, I'd eat the salad, rrr, 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 ate it all. Hungry this time, wasn't I? I was hungry. Not fussy this time, but hungry. And I was more grateful for it. The iced tea, that didn't just get drunk, that got poured into bottles, old plastic bottles. <laughs> old plastic bottles and saved for later. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, that was now a, a, a valuable commodity, <laughs> the iced tea that I didn't like before, that I was now pouring into bottles of safe later. So my perception about the environmental factors had changed. My gratitude, my perception of gratitude had changed dramatically simply through uh, yeah, being, being more hungry, I guess. I've been like that recently over COVID. I've said about not having chocolate. You know, I guess the reason I'm enjoying this cake so much this chocolatey cake is because I don't have easy ready well now we've got different rules now I can go into any shops I want it's just up to me now but I haven't had easy ready access to all those things so yeah at first you might not realise this so if you're homesick and you're watching this and at first you're not going to realise this that those horrible things that you think are horrible you're one day going to love and that's going to be your best thing <laughs> how horrible life will be <laughs> that the worst things will be your best thing but no it's not that bad actually it turns out you find a new appreciation for things you realize the um delicate nuance of why iced tea might be better than just ditch water <laughs> you realize that there are, are pleasant qualities to it that although it's not the hot tea with milk in that you're used to a bit of lemon a bit of zest you know you can get used to that they had to in poland right but that's good, isn't it? That's good. So changing the way we feel, thinking positively and feeling grateful helps you to feel better. And especially if you're feeling homesick, feeling grateful for the where you are and what you have, even though you feel homesick. Interesting concept. Simply, cha simply changing feelings and attitudes to be happy. <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that one. Sim simply change your feelings. Ever felt depressed? <laughs> Ever felt depressed? Well, don't. Job done. Thanks, Mental Health Monday. Just to edit that into a podcast week on week on week on week on week. Do you feel bad? Simply change your feelings. It's not that easy, is it? It's not that easy. Your feelings are born of... Oh, no. See, my feelings now are born of events. This just happened. You see what that is? That's a tiny nut and bolt that the dog could eat. So you've got to make sure that goes back in there. And it's come out of this clapperboard. And I broke my clapperboard by clapping it. That's going to get a bad review on Amazon. Right, so... <laughs> but things happen and they make you feel things. That happened, it made me feel bad. Didn't it? So I can't just control my feelings. Don't be, st don't be stupid. That's the... You can... You rubbish. No, what we're learning in Mental Health Monday is that you actually can. Your feelings and your thoughts, your thoughts and feelings and your actions and your thoughts and your actions and your feelings, they're all in a triangle and what we do changes them. So we're in control of the way we act. We're in control of the way we feel in a way. We can allow ourselves to feel it and to revel and roll in, wallow in the feelings. Or we can say to ourselves, hang on, Gonna have to distract myself now and think about something differently. We're in charge of our thinking at least. That thing fell out. I wasn't in charge of my thinking then. It was happening. But after it's happened, I've screwed it in the wrong way now. I've noticed it's back to front chuffer. Uh, after it happened, I had a moment to grab hold of my thoughts and say, what do I want to think about now? Do I want to think about fixing it or do I want to think about worrying about it? Getting control, taking those moments of mindfulness. Hang on, the sky's blue. It's a median room temperature. My background's blue. Um, blue, do, blue, do, 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 do. Come, come, hang on, come back to what we're doing. It's mindfulness. <laughs> Grabbing hold of your thinking. 
maybe it's the universe telling not to edit a thing. Yeah, I was thinking about that this week. You know, I was thinking about just not editing and uh, just chuffing it all up there and then just getting on with it. And I watched somebody else who's popular, like quite a lot more popular than me, and they did a really good video. And I thought, did they write that video? Because I'm pretty sure they didn't. I'm pretty sure they sat down and someone had written a load of stuff and they just sat there and read it. So they, and then I clicked on the thing, edited by, as someone else has edited it. So it's easy for them. I sit here and do all the talking. I have to write the stuff as well. And I have to edit. <laughs> and I'm not popular. So, you know, I haven't got any any of those things going for me. <laughs> Look, anyway, you can't change your feelings, can you? But you can. You can. You must. You must find ways to at least stick a spanner in that system, in that ever-decreasing circle of spiral of... You stick a spanner in it. We're going to start acting different. We're going to start changing the way I think. We're going to start doing that and it's going to change the way I feel. Yeah, you can. You can. I've got raw talent going for me. I used to. I was I was young. I was a contender. I could have been someone. <laughs> uh, I don't know where that gets you these days. I don't know. Well, it didn't get me. Like I'm, I'm actually starting to believe that as well, that I'm getting to past the age where any of it matters because there are younger people who are more talented. So, you know... Even I would put my ticket on them. <laughs> you know, I've I've had my crack of the whip. Oh, oh no, we're just gonna we just it might be slower progress, but we're progress all the same. We're always moving forward, aren't we? And I'm enjoying what I'm doing. I'm enjoying being here with you. And we're gonna start doing some more streaming on YouTube as well. We're gonna start getting that podcasty thing set up. I've got ideas about guests. I'm gonna get this I'm worried about it all as well. I'm worried. I'll tell you one of the things that's helped me back before we get on and finish homesickness, one of the things that's held me back actually doing that this last couple of weeks is getting a guest on and then it crashing or Zoom crashing or the kilobytes dropping and it not working and me having to say to the people, sorry, not even being able to say it to them because the computer crashed. <laughs> and just being like, oh, I got you on as a guest and that went badly. And then people think, oh, that went badly. I'm not doing that. And the people I want as guests as well, there's some really attainable people who I think are brilliant like people I know basically uh, game development development people that I've met who I think are brilliant who are actually keen to talk to me but I'm worried about get doing it so there's one and then the other thing is uh, there are people I want who are not that um, attainable but damn it I'm going to just approach them anyway and then I'm scared about that so let's say I approach ContraPoints and she says yes or Stuart Lee agrees to do it then, oh my, oh, it's not all set up, or oh, I'm not even tidy the room. <laughs> Am I going to be a good host? Is the Zoom going to work? What if you want to come here? My plan is to get that set up so you can come here, you can sit and do your interview, we can do it live, or record it however you feel comfortable. I need to get another camera or two so that we can do the cutting between the faces. Go to them is an option, is an option, but I get really anxious about driving long distances at the moment. But I wanted to have it set up here so I know it's working. Oh, cause, streaming and editing as well and not editing sorry live a computer can't be moved and you know what if they haven't got good internet um but there are options you know maybe do it as a recorded thing yeah definitely um, but get all that set up and working and get the guests in and because i live in stratford and it's a nice town stratford upon avon then maybe people won't mind if i pay them to come here and they can stop in a hotel and go to the theater and have a little bit of dinner you know maybe they won't mind they can come and sit in obviously contrapoints won't come here because she lives in america but like we can zoom call those people and then yeah i can do some some i can do everything we can get it all done but like i said i've just held back a little bit by getting the setup sorted spending the money on the kit not lots of money on big kit because i've got quite a lot of bits now now it's down to just a couple more arm microphone arm things and a nice table and a nice chair spending the money and doing it and also my fear <laughs> my anxiety about being the interviewer that I'm not actually afraid of doing when I'm in the flow of doing it. Just I'm worried about it not working and them feeling like, well, this is a bit rubbish and me letting us down by not having it. Because we've seen it crash. We've been here on stream when it's crashed. I don't always have the kilobytes. That computer doesn't always, I don't know, you know, but I'm going to have to just have a, have a go at it. And ContraPoints has incredible sets. I could do that over there as well. <laughs> she does though, yeah. I'll tell you what I like about ContraPoints and also H Bomber Guy for this is they've obviously gone to film school. I think... They've gone to film. They've gone to university and been exposed to ideas about media, and they don't just create videos with con content. 
but they just create beautiful imagery for the videos because they care enough to and want to use the lights and want to have a red light and a green light and a, you know I've done my little backlight and my one light oh, that's as far as I've gone <laughs> I'm not a lighting director who's that concerned to have multiple but that's another thing we have to do for our guests we have to make the guests look nice yeah, I was all right on the last interview, but I was worried the whole time. I was really worried that it was going to conk out and it was going to crash. And I looked back on it and I felt that I uh, ended it too abruptly. Uh, I want a long form podcast sort of interview, a sort of hour long. Tell me about your childhood, you know, that sort of thing. And I was too keen to just get the um, obvious answers done and okay we've got those in the can at least I've done it let's just quit while we're ahead sort of thing so I was a bit worried and I, I realised as well that other streamers just uh, they're on on stream oh let's just get you on now I'm just talking now but for me to open up Zoom now and get someone else talking would fill me high anxiety I wouldn't be able to do it now I'd want to at least clear up this table <laughs> I don't know just the table but I'd want to clear the table and make sure there's extra batteries for the mouse in case the mouse breaks and you see I'm already feeling anxious about something else so I need to get that a bit more sorted and we'll get there. But we are getting there. We are getting there. I don't know why I went off on that random tangent. Talking about how we're making content isn't content. This is content, look. Simply changing your feelings. Yeah, you can't. <laughs> oh, no, but you can. That's what we were saying, yeah. Reframing time in order to perceive the time away as shorter. That's a really good one as well. I like that. Reframing time. No, that doesn't make sense, does it? You can't... Well, you're there. It's like you're there it's, as long as it lasts, isn't it? But if I'm there for six weeks, and, oh, God, I've got to be here for the whole six weeks, it's just a... You know, it, it's almost, it's longer than a month. It's a month and a... You know what I mean? It, it seems big. But when we were there, on this six weeks fencing camp, <laughs> excuse me, and when I was there, I didn't think of it like that. I felt we in terms of Saturdays or uh, you get through how many days left till we go home <laughs> you don't even think about that too much at the start because you're not thinking that way at the start but when you do you know how many days do we go home is, is maybe it seems big or small I don't know but recontextualizing the time changing how you think about it in order to perceive it as shorter so another way of saying it is you know it's six weeks out of a year isn't that much is it it's not that much of a year but if it's your whole summer holidays, it's all of your time, isn't it? So different ways of thinking about time. Yeah, it, that's quite important. And something that you can only find out if someone's feeling homesick or if you're feeling homesick, talking about how you feel to somebody can elucidate this piece of information, can't it? It can illuminate this piece. It can bring out this piece of information, how you're feeling about, you know, how long are you away for? How long have you got till you do go home? Uh, you know how long have you felt like this and the way you answer that the, the way you refer to time then you should stop and think about it and say can I think about this period of time differently is it worth doing yeah and it will be worth doing because it's going to help you feel less homesick renewing a connection with home through letter writing observable method to feel closer to home so they've suggested you write letters home and that makes you feel closer to home because you're thinking about it which is good but in contrast to one of the others, which is to distract yourself and do something fun. I think they're both important in different ways. I think that it is important to give yourself maybe half an hour's homesick time, half an hour's thinking time. I do it, talked about it with grief and loss and things, to give yourself that uh, worry time. Yeah, so when you finish writing the letter, it's then time to do something fun. It's important to put that at the end of it. Because if you just renew the connection with home and just constantly think about it, maybe you're thinking about homesickness more, maybe it's making it worse. So I'd be careful with that one, although I agree that, you know, writing your feelings. And also what's good, you know, when you're away on holiday, you write a little postcard, don't you? You write a little, we do have this tradition in England. <laughs> we have this tradition, wherever you go on your holidays, you get a little bit of card, right? I know you know what a postcard is, but I'm telling you anyway. You get a little bit of card, right? a little big face. A little bit of card. It's about the size of that. About the size of that. And on the one side is a picture, often funny. Sometimes it's several pictures of the place you are. And on the back is just space to write on one side and space to put your address. So you know that whoever... This, this message can be seen by everyone <laughs> through the postal service. Everyone. Wish you were here. I always wondered about wish you were here when I was a kid. I always wondered whether it meant 
you like when you when I received okay so I've just received a postcard where's my it's a giant postcard and it looks like a clapperboard that says Scotty Hotties but it, it's a postcard trust me and it says wish you were here now does that mean you wish I was out there with you that's nice or does it mean I bet you wish you were here but you're not you're at over you're at home which actually is better in homesickness terms but uh, no does it mean that you yeah humble bragging you wish you were here don't you but you're not <laughs> or does it mean i wish you were here i wish you were here with me to enjoy this together i wonder if i wonder if that's what it means yeah i wonder i wonder i always thought that it i always felt the negative in it wish you were here <laughs> bet you wish you were here yeah well you can well you're not uh yeah, so but I always went through. One, we always did something to our nan and granddad, our, to our grandparents from from Holly Holly Bob's. But I always wondered, you know, everyone can read the thing, can't they? So it's not really about the message. You don't write anything to, you know, you don't write hidden the money under the mattress and <laughs> the key to the safe is in the dog. You don't write that. You don't write, uh, you know, your deepest, you know, deepest innermost anguish on a postcard. You just write, oh, we went to the seaside. I saw a crab. Uh, we have been eating at a local restaurant, which we're going to come on to in a minute and see about food, <laughs> which we promised at the start of the episode. You know, you're not here. I am because I'm important. <laughs> yeah, like you write that on your postcard and you just send it. It's just a feeling, isn't it? It's just sentiment, a sentiment. I'm thinking of you. And uh, yeah, now it's Facebook and Instagram. It doesn't, it's not important if it's Facebook. If someone sends me a tweet from their holiday, it's not as important as if it comes through the letterbox and I can put it on the wall and it's the pictures and it's a souvenir and a memory. Uh, yeah, we had that concept. We had that concept. It was quite big. Uh, but that's a good way of writing home. That's not spending hours thinking about all the, the negative things that are making you feel homesick and all the positive things about home that you miss. It's not that. It's saying to the people at home, here are some nice things about what we're doing here. And I'm going to be back soon. So postcards also say that, don't they? they? In my experience, they tend to get to the person you're sending them to at about the same time as you get home anyway. You're only on holiday for a week and a half. The post doesn't go that. It's not like super duper airmail from... You know, usually we would go somewhere like Spain, and you know, it's not a, it's not a vast distance from England, but you know, the postcard would arrive two weeks after we would. <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's not really about this communication, is it? It's about a sort of I'll be back home real soon. These postcards just to say, you know, thinking of you while I'm not there. Yeah, so maybe a postcard, that sort of way of writing home is more mentally healthy because it's not about worry and anxiety. It's about the little highlights, little highlights. Maybe writing postcards is a good one. And finally, another way of coping, and these are ways of coping with homesickness. So I perfectly edit into a perfect little video of these will. Talking with someone who could provide support and help them to make new friends. That's a good one. So making that's all bundled in together there. Talking to someone, important. We do it here, but it, it, you know, feeling homesick. How oh, are you? <laughs> Shut up and go back to bed. Oh, I'm glad we had that chat. <laughs> no, talking to someone. You know, maybe they're feeling it too. Maybe you can talk about some of these ideas that we brought up and how you can implement them. Talking to someone's a good start point for anything when it comes to mental health. And they might provide support and help you to make new friends in a new situation. Any friends are going to be new, I assume, unless you're there with people that you already know, I guess. But it's one of the joyful things that you can partake in, making new friends. And it can lead you out of this homesickness feeling, can't it? I've always felt myself, uh, <laughs> when people, when I've been in Poland, I've spoken to the Polish people. So God damn it, if I see someone Polish in our country, I'm going to speak to them here and make them feel welcome. Like they made me feel welcome when I was there. And I've always felt, because uh, I live in Stratford, it's a multicultural town where people from all over the world come to see Shakespeare plays and visit Shakespeare houses. And there's a lot of American tourists. There's a lot of Chinese tourists. And they're both ends of the spectrum there, aren't they? America and China. Uh, so I've always met a lot of different people knowing that full well they're not going to be here next week. So I just better damn well be polite to them now because this is my first and only impression they're going to get from me. 
So it better well be, you know, positive and polite. Yes, I'll help you get it here. Yes, I can read your map with you. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, because of the tourist town, I've felt that global citizenship. But uh, helping people to make friends, it did. I, I remember being in Poland, actually, and feeling homesick and making new friends and it turned out they were doing similar um we went to a university campus and <laughs> we hung out in this like what's so good about making friends when you are homesick is that you get to see the real life and the um genuine authentic life so all of a sudden i wasn't just like away in a little room on my own even though i couldn't really understand what everyone was saying i got the vibe drinking partying you know people hanging out in this room in that room uh I got the vibe so I could hang out and I felt the you know that vibe made me feel less homesick and making new friends talking to them they weren't um as I say they were very positive and welcoming so uh, we were finding things that we felt in common that reminded me of home that they you know lots of positive in that yeah I think that's a really good one at the end there making new friends providing support as the primary goal and what's interesting about that final one is that it's not about trying to recontextualize the environment it's not about trying to find your way home quicker or bargain your way out of the feelings of how long this is going to go on for. It's about something different entirely that isn't about home or where you are. It's about people. And I've talked about this Valhalla before, <laughs> that we all meet in Valhalla, don't we? We've all met in Valhalla before. And uh, that's why we have this connection. And you don't know it. You can't uh, name it. You don't know which wars we've fought side by side in and um you know how many times we've reached out hands to each other and how many times we've fallen but uh and how many we will again you know you don't know that but we all meet in valhalla don't we so <laughs> uh it gives you that feeling um you're making new friends you're not trying to fix the homesickness by fixing the environment or, or anything like that you're finding something different that can make you feel happy so that's that's a good one to finish on. I like that. Don't know and a half. That's not bad, is it? Not not bad at all. On the old homesickness, got the nice picture up the whole time. Home sweet home there. That's your chat window. I'm going to change your bubble browser to this one. There we go. Change that back to Mental Health Monday. There you go. Wee. Wee. Mental Health Monday. Oh, what a chuffing. What a chuffer. I can eat my cake again now. Though. Nearly run out of tea. That's Lifeline. It's in America. You can't call it if you're in Afghanistan. You're not even watching this. <laughs> That's Mental Health Monday. I'm not laughing about Afghanistan. <laughs> Could you imagine if someone from Afghanistan was watching this and I said that and they felt bad? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am actually sorry, you know. I feel so sorry for all of them. What a big waste of time, eh? Waste of time, money, and and all that. Hey, eh? why do they get up to all that? And what can we do to fix it? What can we do? Certainly not blowing things up. Blowing things up is definitely not going to fix th these problems that these people are having. Definitely not blowing things up. That's one we definitely. I think we will end America. Well, Biden's having a. He's having a, doing a speech. We will end America's longest war. Joe Biden defends the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and Taliban takeover. Well, look, he doesn't defend the Taliban takeover, mate. <laughs> what, a way to, what a way to word that. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. No, no matter how I move it. Web of a browser. That's got that on there. There, you can see at the bottom there, breaking. We will end America's longest war. Joe Biden defends US withdrawal from Afghanistan a mid Taliban takeover. All oh, right, a mid Taliban. He didn't. <laughs> he's not defending the takeover from the Taliban, is he? Not defending that. But you've got to give him a bit of a uh, 
what am I doing here? I'm trying to turn off that extra stormtrooper. How do you, where's the stormtrooper come from? Look, I'll move him over there. Okay, now he's over there. Breaking. It could be a she. It could be a she, the stormtrooper. They, now they are over there. Breaking. We will end America's longest war. Joe Biden defends the withdrawal. See, you've got to give him a bit of uh, slack here because he didn't run into power on anything to do with the war, did he? He didn't, he didn't start the war. It's 20 years old, this war. I can see why he wants to end America's longest war. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? You don't want to be at war for 20 years forever, for indefinite. No, absolutely. And it wasn't even him that started the withdrawal of the troops, was it? It was the right... Like, you say he's going to receive criticism from the right because they're going to criticize... Like, they're going to just criticize any... Like, he, he, at this stage in politics, Joe Biden could come out and say, look, I actually quite like hamburgers. And then the far right are going to say, hamburgers aren't even American anymore. You shouldn't even be eating them. What are you, German? And then he could come out the next week and say, all right, look, I'm, a, I'm against cheeseburgers. We're going to ban them. And they would say, ban cheeseburgers. What are you? You know, how dare you? They're as American as apple pie. Have to have, we have to have cheeseburgers. If you're trying to take away our cheeseburgers, then it's one of our rights. And then the next week you could say, all right, fair enough. We're having cheeseburgers on the menu in every school and free cheeseburgers for all. In, in every American household, free cheeseburger day. And then they'd say, you cut free cheeseburgers, you can't give people cheeseburgers, what are you doing? Are you mad? It's, it'd make them all fat. You're trying to kill them. It's, it's un-American to have cheeseburgers. <laughs> it's, it's just silly, isn't it, politics? It's just Whatever you do, they're going to try and say it's silly. But uh, what's so silly about it is right wing, left wing, you know, 20 years of governance... Uh, so everyone's implicated in all aspects of being at war and also withdrawing. So they're all in it. You know, it doesn't matter which side of the parties you're on. They've all had a go at being in charge, and this is what it's come to. <laughs> Donald Trump was the one that signed the orders to remove the troops, wasn't he? So they were the ones, the right wing were the ones that did campaign on a ticket to get in so they could take the troops home. But uh, in the end of it, the problem is not really whether American troops are there or not. The problem is whether Afghanistan and its people can run a country and run the security so that they can have an election and then follow the results of the election. I don't know. They will run images of terrorism 24 hours a day. Uh, it's going to be strange. This That is a strange one. That is another strange one. Because the whole reason we were in there was to stop the bad terrorism, wasn't it? So what... Do they just not mind about the bad terrorism anymore and it's okay these days? Or have the Taliban agreed that they're not going to do any more bad terrorism? I don't know. Maybe they want the bad terrorism, yeah, because uh, the fascism. I mean, there are all those questions, aren't there, about who's initially doing the bad terrorism, considering we armed Osama bin Laden, trained him, paid for him to fight on our behalf in the war in Yugoslavia, and then he was the one that did the bad terrorism against us. <laughs> But you've also got these agencies like the MI5 and the CIA who literally infiltrate these bad terrorist organisations. And when we say infiltrate, what I mean is agents like MI5, CIA, this is facts, isn't it? You're not going to disagree with me on this. Everyone's going to agree. Their job is, some of them, to be part of these groups, to go unseen, to be part of the group. And when they say, we're we going to do a bombing, let's take hand... Rev put up your hands do you want to do a bombing uh, like a terror bombing and then one of these people in the room is going to be in the CIA or the MI5 or whatever it is and they're going to put their hand up aren't they I'd like you to do it because they're not going to say no I'm not into bombing I'm really working for the CIA oh they're going to say no yeah I'm here I'm taking notes whatever passing it on to the CIA so we've got people that we pay working for their organisations <laughs> At different levels, at different levels. Sometimes I wonder if they just say, you know, do a bit of a bombing then. And then people say, oi, CIA, they've got me doing a bombing. And, you know, this is a bit of a shitter, isn't it? I've sworn that. This is a bit of a shit because I'm, I'm actually undercover. So can you pull me out now? And the CIA just say, can you pull me out now? Is there anyone on the end of this phone? Am I, am I going mad? Am I going mad? <laughs> Nothing to do with us. Never heard of him. Never heard of... I don't know who he is. 
What, Abdullah Tim? No, yeah, not on our records. No, he's not on our records. I don't know. It could go like that, couldn't it? It could go like that. I don't know. What we do know for a fact is they are there in the rooms, the MI5 and the CIA. Their operatives are infiltrating these groups, aren't they? They are infiltrating. We better hope so. That's what we pay them our money for. That's what we pay our spies to do. So we better hope they're in those rooms. I think. Unless they're coordinating attacks against us under the knowledge, if not direction, of our own government. That would be bad. That would be bad. It's hard to know what, what to think these days, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, I'm not into big... Like When I was younger, I was big into conspiracy theories. And it wasn't that... Like now I'm not so big into them because it seems so obvious that some of these things are not what they seem. Maybe we should do. Maybe we should take apart some of these. You know, I don't really want to be on the internet having confusing thoughts and giving other people confusions either because ultimately I also think you don't know the answers to some of these things. So whilst conjecture is interesting and you might get led down some rabbit holes, it's not mentally healthy to be following those it's not like a string on a jumper that you can keep following until you eventually find the source of the wall and you find out the true nature of the thing. Because it's not like that, because it's just in the air and you're chasing smoke. You end up not feeling like you've got a firm grasp on the reality. And who can have that firm grasp? Who can give you the evidence that you so require? Who can give you the evidence that you can really trust? You know, So it doesn't... It's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult. And that's what I'm saying, is it's difficult. And so because of that, it's best not to get all het up about one certain thing that you're maybe not so certain about, whether it be this or that. <laughs> um, well, sorry, I'll just, let me let me read. Our bombs and drones didn't fix anything, yeah. yeah. And uh, interesting that the twin, even the, the Twin Towers, uh, you know, there was... Uh, conversation and conjecture about whether those were aircraft or drones and things wasn't there and whether the planes were crashed elsewhere all these funny ideas weren't there all thrown up I mean it did seem mad to me as well that someone would want to do that with planes uh, what what it achieved objectively you know for who, who and for what I don't really understand myself but you know there is this I, I, I think a better way of looking at a conspiracy theory. I can talk from a UK perspective, the London bombings where people got on trains and buses with bombs on their back. I actually believe that it's quite probable that one of them, if not a more prominent member of the group, was at some stage from our service, you know, MI5 secret service. And that, like I say, that our MI5 secret service, rather than stopping these events from happening, sometimes allow them to happen. Uh, so they can't say it's us that's doing it. We're not doing it to ourselves, but we're aware of it and we're monitoring it. And, you know, it's it always interesting to me. This is this is a better way of saying how... I'm not saying a conspiracy. I'm saying these doubts and ideas come up in my mind. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that, like I said earlier, I don't fall heavily on one opinion and say, oh, it's got to be this and QAnon or any of that. I shouldn't have even said that because now everything will get taken down off of YouTube. But uh, I'm not saying that because... Uh, it's muddy waters. Just I'm throwing up ideas, but uh, it's always interesting that the people who get killed by these terrorists, the people who get blown up by the terrorist attacks, are not the actual targets of uh, supposedly the organisations who are attacking. So it's put that another way. Like Osama bin Laden didn't blow up the president, did he? Osama bin Laden didn't blow up. Uh, the military did he he didn't take out anything substantial in terms of american infrastructure it was quite a big visual impact it was very sad all the people that died but it didn't achieve much did it and in our country uh with the london bombings the people who got blown up were on on a bus or on a tube train so that's not boris johnson or the prime minister of the day you know it's not the posh people in their limousines they're not the houses of parliament or you know they're not going to the posh restaurants or the posh places in town with the people with the money and the jeff bezos is you know that's not who they're attacking even though that is their seemingly their enemy they're attacking just normal day-to-day -day people on the streets on the streets we live in a multicultural economy 
in in London. Those people on those buses were Muslims themselves. Some of them, like it just, it seems strange to me that if you wanted to make an impact, for, if that's what they wanted to do, those terrorists, why they would target the most expendable collateral damage that they could the common people you know i talk about this often don't I, on the channel about how we are the common people together and the masses and the masters and you know and it seems strange that you do something to because it has the biggest effect on us common people doesn't it and what you see in the media and things like that yeah it has a big effect on us but uh, in the big picture you know it didn't change things for those terrorist groups and what their demands were and what they could achieve it, it didn't change anything really it didn't change anything for the masses for the posh people with the money who making the decisions <laughs> yeah why do they target the common people the collateral damage and when we talk about collateral damage from the wars you know i'm talking about human life but let's not forget that we as the west are prepared you know this american involvement this english involvement in this british involvement in afghanistan we're prepared to kill them <laughs> we're prepared to bomb them to blow up their schools and hospitals so a little bit of collateral damage, a few children here and there, a few normal people, we don't really care about. That's war. So if there's a war going on and we don't care about normal people and collateral damage, why do we care that much about them? Because they're from the UK. Well, obviously we do because we're normal people and we care. But what I'm saying is when you're in the war room, when you're in the political room, when you're in the Donald Trump room or the whatever room, you know, do you care about the collateral damage if your political agenda is being pushed? Do you care if several children get shot in a school, if you can push something this way? Or do you... Uh, I, I, and then this, I'm not talking... No, that was wrong with me to talk about school shootings and what people refer to as false flags and all this. What, what I'm saying is that when it comes to making decisions about protecting people or whether they count as collateral damage, whether they care, you know, I don't, I don't honestly don't think that they care about us that much. Um... Like the one where we went in solid to help the people, yeah. <laughs> That's another thing. I, I Obviously, I imagine there's a lot of this has been about war, uh, of this war has been about oil and control over oil and control over means of production and avenues of transport and pipelines. I'm sure there's a lot of that. I also wondered whether there was something sinister behind the scenes that we're not seeing. You know, some other resources that are being shared around or traded. We don't want your cobalt or your oil or a strategic location <laughs> to educate girls, yeah. Yeah, and this always troubled me as well, is if it's... Because uh, the reason that Afghanistan was picked, of course, saying about um, strategic locations is it's not only it's been strate strategic, but Britain's been in Afghanistan since the 1700s. Like, we've had Western involvement and foothold there for a long time. Maybe longer than before that, I don't know. But we've easily easier to conquer them when they only had pointy sticks. <laughs> Now we've sold them all guns, it's, it's more difficult. I mean, where do you think they get those guns from? Where do you think they get those guns from? Uh, yeah, so uh, it always was interesting to me, and still is, knowing now we've, we've, we have withdrawn, so it makes more sense now, but why we didn't just go into all the countries? Why do, Why stop at Afghanistan? Why is that the one that we're, we're that worried about? Next door they're chuffing them about. In Yemen they're chuffing them about. Israel and uh, Palestine are still at it like can we not just go everywhere and chuff and sort them all out on the way to russia and china are we fuck it then come on bring them on <laughs> yeah it's what it's about isn't it selling guns selling guns the uk still sells an awful lot of arms and ammunition the politicians themselves after they've been prime ministers go on to work for the companies that sell the guns you know yeah girls need education i doubt there are many girls left in afghanistan that aren't married off to talibani warlords these days yeah so yeah yeah I don't know the worst thing about it all there isn't there's so many worst things about it there are so many worst things about it but one of the worst things about it all is the the loss of those like of a 20 year war for nothing everything they've done over the last 20 years all of the mistakes all of the decisions whatever they want to call them all the lives all the legs all the arms and faces, whatever. It's all just been for nothing, really. Hasn't it? It's all just been for nothing, really. That's the that's all that endeavour. We've shot men to Mars. Not men to Mars. We've shot men to space and rockets to Mars. Not even men, women, people. 
Forget the patriarchy. Why can't we pull that effort into something good? Why do you have to chuff in, pour it all into blowing each other up? Not even each other. Not even blowing each other up. Just, you know, most of these people don't care about any of that. They just want to go to school and, you know, have something for dinner. Maybe get a chance to play hockey or boxing or something. Buy a Nintendo. <laughs> anyway, look, Mental Health Monday is degenerating into me just rambling. <laughs> and uh, there's a lovely button here. It says Raid Channel. I'm not going to do that yet. Still not onto Raid Channel. Still not there yet with that Twitch literacy. But we are on the way to doing more. And I'm on the way to getting more done. I am. Even though it seems like... I mean, on the weeks when it seems like there's less happened on stream, there's more happened behind the scenes in my life to try and push towards getting things done. Uh, yeah. But I need to do more. I am aware of that. I need to do more. Listen, you be good. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I've got to go now. I've got to go and walk the dog. I want to get back on and chat in and being a streamer, you know. At the same time, I'm quite aware that I don't just want to turn this on and just yamble. I want to bring things to the table. I don't just want to have a sort of, I'm on the internet every day, see how that goes, existence. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, uh, not it's, it's not spinning plates right now. It's a lot of ideas being juggled, a lot of things crystallizing. Yeah. So anyway, you've been good. You've been good. We've talked about homesickness, ways to combat it. We'll edit that down into a nice episode for Mental Health Monday, which I will endeavour to... I've edited last week's. It's just not there yet. It just has to be uploaded, which is going to take all bloody night because it's 12 gig. <laughs> yeah, 12 gig. But uh, that is coming along, Mental Health Monday. It's a resource. It's what we call legacy content, which means it's always there, even if I'm not it will always be there even if youtube decides to switch it well youtube can do what it wants with it can't it but uh when i'm dead it will still exist <laughs> now that's not what they mean by legacy content what they mean is that it's the sort of content that it doesn't matter what day of the week it is or what's in the news uh, simone biles twisties is obviously obviously topical isn't it but doom scrolling how to crush anxiety panic attacks that's always going to be there isn't it and they're the main things that people are concerned about with the mental health. I see so much conversation about anxiety on ASMR community, whether it be, you know, watch, oh, thank you for the tippies. Look, walkie doggy tippies. <laughs> uh, tippies, I'm gonna, when he's walking around the block, when he's, I'm going to say, you've got tippies for that. <laughs> he's not going to know. I'm going to tell him, you've, you've got tippies for that. <laughs> Daddy's got tippies. It warms his hands, those tippies. That's a hand warmer. Hand warmer in the winter months. Uh, yeah. But yeah, he's building up there. It's there. That that resource is there for people to come find when they're having these problems. It's something that I've talked about on ASMR Jesus channel. On True by Norn ASMR. On the old True by Norn ASMR. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's the, no, I'm here. I'm here. I'm still here. Uh, on True Bonner and SMR, I've uh, talked about mental health now. I've actually done some of these episodes on there now. Stop putting them up there because it's got its own channel. But um, it's something I always... What was I trying to say? Yeah, through the SMR, I was introduced to the concepts. was suffering from it myself. was introduced to the concepts, found the resources. Not through. I didn't find the resources through the SMR. found them separately. Mind.org, Samaritans and all that. I found them separately. But now we're making this resource this uh legacy content that's definitely week by week week on week that's happening that's daddy tippies <laughs> tippies for me thank you two little horns i always i don't know why it's the it's the little cone doing the thing i always imagine a little mouse blowing that horn Doo -doo. <laughs> little mouse they've got to come out from under the skirting boards if they're going to come out to do that i'll have to make a little mouse on a trumpet out of glue and Lego, you'll you'll see what's in my brain one day. But uh, and I do I thank you, I thank you for that because that's my eating money these days. That's <laughs> that's what I tell the government I earn, and they deduct me appropriately. <laughs> uh, the uh, 
yeah, the resource is there. That's what I'm trying to say. But this isn't my end goal, is it, as a streamer, is to create a mental health resource. That's something I wanted to make sure was there. Just, and it, I love the fact that every week it's adding on and it's going to stay there. Absolutely, it's there. Consistency with that, good. I need to add to that consistency with more content, with the art, with the passion, with the ASMR even, because I've got this rig set up, been messing about with it. Yeah, need to do that. Need to work harder. And that's the plan. That's the agenda, Brenda. You be good, my little pukos. You be good. I'm going to go and walk that dog. I'm going to go and earn my tippies by going and picking up poopies off the road. And uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, even if poopies are not provided, I will find a poopy and pick it up. So you be good. And if you can't be good, you're naughty.